Good evening and welcome to another one of my uh, streams. So this time around I'm going to be looking at the previous four tracks I've written during my music making live streams. And uh, basically I'll just be kind of going through the changes that I made since the streams, what's what I've learned from the tunes and all that kind of thing. So, um, so I just started a conversation just before this actual part of the stream started about uh, people having issues watching the stream on Twitch. If you're watching this on YouTube, then congratulations, you probably won't have any issues. Um, somebody's mentioned maybe disabling a constant bitrate for, um, for what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, I read that Twitch really doesn't like that, otherwise I would use variable bitrate. Um, so it's something I might look into. Um, yeah, really, really weird. So uh, anyway, so like I said, during, today, during today's stream, I'm gonna be looking at the past four tracks that I've written during my music making live streams. And I've got like a whole bunch of notes and stuff that I'd like to go through. Um, but it'll also be more of a kind of general Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions or anything like that, that they'd like to ask me during the stream, or if you'd like me to show off any particular techniques or, or tricks that I might have glossed over during the stream originally, then please, please let me know. Um, and I will go into them in more depth. This is kind of your opportunity to get me to actually explain what the hell I've been doing in these tracks as opposed to my usual blast through and get it done. So Todd Tyler has asked me, have you checked out Friction yet? I absolutely have checked out Friction. I mentioned this um, uh, during last week's stream where I, I haven't actually <laughs> reinstalled it again yet. So yeah, I actually provided some of the sounds that came with Friction. Um, I can't remember the name of any of the patches off the top of my head, but um, I did some of the more kind of ethereal sort of synthy combinator patches. Um, I decided not to go for the more string, like typical string sounds for, for the soundbank because I figured people who are more familiar with that kind of thing could provide those patches. So yeah, so I actually did a whole bunch of patches for the actual instrument itself. So I've actually been using it for quite a while. Um, but unfortunately, I, un I uninstalled it for these particular streams so I wouldn't be breaking my NDA. People wouldn't spot it and be like, oh, hey, what's that? So unfortunately, I haven't actually reinstalled it since a couple of streams ago when I removed it just before. It was just before Friction actually came out. Um, Monkey++ Plus Plus says, seems it would actually be really cool for synth-ish sound synth synth sounds. Easy for me to say. Um, yeah, it is actually really, really cool. Um, and yeah, you can get some really interesting sounds out of it. Some really expressive synthy sounds. It's not just for straight up orchestral stuff, although it does that really, really well. Um, I'm thinking it'll be really good to maybe mix it up with some sampled strings just to kind of add that sort of extra layer of expressiveness over the top while getting the kind of ensemble sound that, that samples excel at basically. So it's very, very cool. So the first track I'm going to be going over is Midnight Circuits, which I wrote on the 23rd of July, if the date at the top is anything to go by, although I've just realized you can't actually see that in the stream. Um, so yeah, this was written on the 23rd of July, and I haven't actually changed this apart from the maximizer on the output. I've just bumped, sort of knocked the input gain down for the purposes of this stream. So I haven't actually put any other sort of master effects or anything like that here. It's the same as it was before. So I'm just going to play that through and I'll talk a bit about what I've changed, that kind of thing, and go over some questions. Uh, if there's anything you'd like me to go over that you hear or anything like that, please let me know and I'll, I'll do that afterwards. So here we go. This is Midnight Circuits.
So that's Midnight Circuits had some interesting comments throughout, so I'm just going to kind of catch up on those. Um, <laughs> Clovermutt said, not to sound controversial, but this track gives me big Adam Fielding vibes. Well, I could, I could safely say that's not a particularly controversial statement. Um, but actually, oddly enough, I do actually know kind of what you mean. It kind of has a sort of older older feel to it but kind of i don't know it's it's i it i, I recognize where you're coming from um but i can't really explain why um anyway also uh, someone mentioned the low end so i feel like i should probably dip into that so the base itself is provided courtesy of respire which is the rack extension version of the spire synth um which is really really nice it can produce some really nice sounds but i find it kind of a pig to work with in terms of actually creating your own sounds. So you might have noticed this is based on a preset that comes with Respire, which is called Beatitude. And I've used that in a few streams just because it has a really satisfying sound to it. It's a really nice way of filling out the low end. Um, and I didn't really change it at all. So sometimes a preset just works nicely and I don't see any problem with using using presets. Oh, I tell a lie. I did change one thing. Uh, I turned off the chorus. Originally that was turned on. So it just made it sound a bit wobbly and I wasn't too keen on that. So I just turned it off. Um, had some other comments. Uh, generally speaking, it sounds it sounds like people like this one, which is really, really cool. Um, so for those who are unaware, I'm actually compiling the first 12 tracks I've written during my streams this year into a, an album of sorts, basically, which I'm planning on releasing at some point. And this is the last track on that album. And it's I think it's a really, really good last track. It's hard to quantify what makes a really good last track, but I think this has kind of got that sort of feeling. And it's... Uh, it's 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 a good last track. I'm really happy with how that's turned out. It was just just a bit of fluke, really, that this one happened to be the one that ended up at the end of the album. So yeah, I'm really really chuffed with how that turned out. So um, yep, yeah, uh, Night Monkey Folkway said Fielding has a Bandcamp, by the way. Yep, it's uh, it's AdamFielding.Bandcamp.com. So if you like what you hear, there's some more better produced stuff over there in sort of varying genres. Uh, Shell Gratuit, apologies if I'm butchering, butchering your nickname here. Uh, yeah, it's a good closer. Um, so <laughs> Tom has said, oh yes, now we're getting the challenge of name for the album. I'm afraid that one is out of your hands. <laughs> I'm going to be doing that one, that one myself. Um, so uh, yeah, Mitch Mood says, love the drums filtering at the end. Uh, lots of talk about orchestral stuff um, because we're talking about some or orchestral stuff before the stream started. Uh, Ty Blue says the feels on this one. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed this this stream. And in fact, I've really, really enjoyed the past few streams. Um, they've been really, really good to work on. Sometimes I click with them and sometimes I don't. I'm normally happy with how they turn out. But um, some yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed the past few um, past few streams in general. So, uh, Monkey++ Plus Plus has said, is the Disperser essentially a BBE Sonic Maximizer with a different name? Um, I can safely say no, it's completely different, and I will explain why in just a second, because that's something I'm going to go into uh, in a sec. So, um, anything else? I'm sure, I'm sure I missed something here. Um, Shagrasu, it says, super nice. How much of an idea do you have in your head when starting this kind of project like chords and progression wise? So I tend to do a little bit of, uh, have, have a bit of a feel before I actually start the stream. So I'll get like a rough idea in my head um, before I start. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I will just start a stream with a completely blank slate and go from there. But I tend to have like a rough idea of what I want to do and then incorporate ideas both from my pre-existing ideas or from the stream or from the chat. Um, so yeah, so it's it's kind of all over the place, unless you mean in general, in which case, um, yeah. So Thor inside us asked, maybe you can go through how you made that click glitch, splitting the duration into smaller note lengths. I would be more than happy to. So I'll, um, you may have noticed I'm using blocks pretty much exclusively for this track. Um, this one uses three blocks, which is two more than I normally use during these streams. So I'm just gonna dip into block three and have a look at the redrum channel. So this particular chappy here is that kind of clicky sound that you hear throughout the track. So if I just play that, that's just sequenced. Um, so what I did originally was I zoomed right in and just drew in a note and it's the grid is currently set to, I'll just recreate it now actually in a separate section. Um, so I zoomed right in, the grid set to 1 128th. So I just drew that in and uh, just had one and drew in two. What did I draw in three? Um, no, so I drew in two notes in quick succession. Then I drew a, one further note that's kind of ha half the length of that. Then another one that's half the length of that and so on. So we get, I mean, you could copy and paste and use other techniques to do this. So, so I've just drawn in a bunch of notes that are kind of, it's sort of halving, well, it's doubling the length of each note after the first two. Um, the first two are kind of just there 
uh, to give it a, a bit of rhythm to start with and keep it kind of on the grid. So when I was done with that, I just pressed F, oh, pressed F8, went to the tools window and doubled the tempo and there we go. So if we play that now, so yeah, we just got that. That's that's how I did it, and I just adjusted the velocity of those. And so yeah, that's that's kind of a common trick that I used to use um, in some of my older tunes, and I haven't actually done that in quite a long time um, because I tend to use stutter edit or buffer or something like that. So that was that was a lot of fun to do. Um, Tom has said, uh, "Can somebody tell me the difference between timeline and block? Why should I use blocks?" That is oh, that is a question. Um, so basically. Blocks are individual patterns that you can create. So I'll, I'll play an instance of a block. This is a block. So that's essentially most of the track right there as, that you just heard. Um, Night Monkey Folkway said, blocks is pattern mode. That is basically it. Um, so that is one entire block. So if you go back to song mode, you can draw in blocks at the top of the track. And that just draws in what is in what the contents of the block are into the sequencer. Then you can draw stuff on top of those blocks. So I've got loads of automation lanes and, and other stuff going on. And you can also mute stuff that's in blocks. So from that one from that one block, I created three blocks in total. Um, you can kind of work backwards and then sort of build into the track from what you've already written. So it's kind of like non-linear songwriting, which I'm a big fan of. Um, so the advantages of doing stuff like that are that you know where the track is going to go. So you can plan accordingly and you've done half the work already. So the t block two and three will just be kind of slight variations on those. I think there's like baseline variations and that kind of thing. Um, so it's it's really, really neat. So yeah, um, Shell Gratuit has said, I really like how blocks are handled versus like loops and session Ableton. I really like Ableton Session View. It's really, really good, but they do work very differently. And I know a lot of people are expecting blocks in Reason to be more similar to the Session View in live. But if you've watched one of my streams, you'll see how I use blocks and kind of build a track around it. And I really, really like working like that. It's a really good, it's a really quick way of getting a song arrangement down. Then you can kind of go into the nitty gritty and kind of add in those extra details that make it pop. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I always find that's kind of the main hurdle between starting a track and actually finishing it is getting that first rough arrangement down. So by using blocks, you can get like a really rough arrangement down. Then you've got the makings of a complete song and you can kind of work on that and add stuff to it. And it also means if you decide to change things further down the line, so say I want to change the bass line, I could just go into block one and just tweak it and it would tweak it for the entire track or every instance where block one's used. So it can be a real real time saver in that regard. Um, so yeah, so it's 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 really, really neat. Uh, Monkey Plus Plus has said, I learned how to use blocks from these streams and I'm forever grateful. You are very welcome. I feel like blocks are kind of one of those underrated features, but once you start using them, if you click with it, you'll really, really click. Um, so yeah, JLEG76 says I much prefer blocks. Reason did that right. It does kind of appeal to my my sort of old tracker sensibilities because with trackers, you would work entirely with, with patterns. So blocks are like super flexible patterns in that regard. Like you can start, you can remove stuff from them. You can add stuff to them while using the same pattern. And it's it's just a really great way of working. Um, so yes, Night Monkey Folkway says blocks for the MF win. Yes. <laughs> so there we go. This, this is also the last track I think I wrote where I, I was using uh, the snort, the nasal riser. So Oh no, it was a it was a bin. I was using the, the bin sound. So yes. Uh, so right, so what did I actually change? So for those who are unaware, when I finish writing these tracks during the stream, what I tend to do is come back to them the following day with a fresh pair of ears, not wearing headphones, listening on monitors, and I'll spot things that are obviously not right and just generally tweak things. So I'm gonna kind of go over some of the things that I changed and tweaked. I've just realized someone asked me a second ago what genre this particular track was, and I'm gonna open that up to the chat because I'm really rubbish at describing which genre my own tunes are in. I would say it's kind of down tempo y, but it's not really because it's got kind of a. I feel like it's got too much of an emotional undercurrent to be down tempo. So, I mean, it is kind of down tempo, it's 80 BPM. So, I don't know. I will I will field this question to the chat. Uh, chill, yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, I, I guess it's some kind of chill. 
Um, yeah, I mean, electronic. I hate the I hate the label itself, electronica, but it's kind of Mitch Mood says easy listening, chill. Yeah, it is. It's uh, I guess it's that kind of thing. Um, I think everyone agreed on fielding esque. Let's go with that orthodox chill. <laughs> so <laughs> I love it. So. I'm just going to explain some of the stuff that I changed after the um, actual stream itself. So the following kind of couple of things apply to pretty much everything that I've changed in all of the streams after the, after the streams themselves. So the first thing I did was I just went to the mixer and kind of had a play around with the levels just to kind of get them, get like a rough mix going. And it's it's kind of hard to explain, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of how I changed things there because I was just listening and tweaking the level. So you might notice I haven't automated any of the faders in the SSL mixer and I never do because if you automate the levels in the, if you automate any of the faders in the SSL mixer, then it means if you want to come back to the track later and adjust the levels, you can't really because you're locked into that automation. So I might adjust the level there, but as soon as I press play in the track, it will jump back up because it's automated. So I'm just going to clear that automation. So if I do want to automate something like like the amplitude or, or anything like that, I'll do it in the rack. And I'm sure I can find an example of this uh, somewhere. So um, he says not being able to find any examples whatsoever. So generally speaking, oh, here we go. I've automated the master fader here for the substance percussion. So if I go to the sequencer lane, which is here. So yeah, I've... Um, I've automated the master level at the end of the track to kind of fade that out instead of automating the SSL mixer. So there we go. Uh, Monkey Plus Plus has asked, when do you use the faders versus the input gain of a channel? Um, so generally speaking, I like to have a good signal going into the actual SSL channel itself. So if you look, if I play the track now, well, you can see from the faders alone, I'm not kind of pushing these right up so that you know you can actually hear what's going on. Everything that's going in there, there's plenty of space to play around with. So um, if I just play the track, you'll be able to see that, you know, the levels are kind of healthy throughout. Um, so here we go. So there's plenty of headroom and there's no crazy fader values. There's nothing pushed to the, to the maximum because as soon as you push a fader, as far as it will go, where do you go from there? There's no way you can go from there. So what I tend to do is use the input knobs at the top. I haven't actually used them at all in this track, which is very unusual. Um, I'll tend to use the input gain knobs at the top to feed the SSL channels with a sufficient signal to play around with, if that makes any sense. So yeah, uh, I am Drabbit has put it really well in the chat and says, think of it like gain knob equals major changes and fader equals minor changes. You want the gain up enough so that the fader gives you a good range of volume to work with. That's a really good way of putting it. Um, so you adjust the input gain. So until you have like enough signal to play around with in the mixer and then you can kind of make your adjustments with some visual feedback from there um so yeah i basically just tweaked the fader fader levels after the after the stream until i ended up with something kind of balanced nothing you could hear all of the instruments nothing it's overbearing or anything like that uh buskin bills has asked do you ever mono check your final exports that's a really good question actually and i tend if i'm working in reason i tend not to um it tends to be more of something i do at the post-production stage so stuff like when i actually come to mastering an album i'll uh, i'll check it at the master stage as i'm playing around but generally speaking because i'm not actually using anything that should cause phasing issues or mono compatibility issues. It's, um, yeah, Cellic Gain does have the option. I used to use an audio interface, which was the Focusrite Pro 40, and that had a really handy button on it so you could just sum everything to mono. It was super useful. Um, yeah, it's it's worth doing. Um, but uh, Jalex76 has said, do you ever separate your drums into individual mix channels and process them separately? Yes, a lot of the time outside of these streams. So um, I tend to keep everything in one channel for the purposes of this stream, of these streams, just because it's kind of simple and it keeps everything in one place. And it also makes bouncing stems kind of a doddle because I can just bounce everything that's here. And it's also the same reason why I don't tend to use a lot of aux sends as well. Um, I can just bounce all of these stems and I'll have the stems straight away. Uh, but yeah, I do tend to separate outputs when I'm using drums, especially if I'm using acoustic drums, because you kind of need to in that instance. Um, because if I'm, it's it's kind of weird, it's hard to explain, but when I'm working with more kind of organic or live instrumentation, I'll tend to break those out into as many channels as I can in the SSL mixer, then start using group channels and stuff like that. I don't tend to do that during these streams. It's just kind of a different way of working. Um, I like to keep things simple and just get as much down as, as possible. 
Um, so yeah, the first thing I will, I will tend to do is kind of just make level adjustments and then I'll kind of bring everything up to keep it in line with my other stream tracks. So kind of a general sort of hard and fast rule of thumb is I'll um, bring all the channels up to the point where the maximizer just start just starts to kick in on the output. So if I bring that, I'm just gonna bring that up to 4.5 dB because that's what it is in the original project file. And I'll bring the output gain minus 1.5 because that will compensate, so it should sound the same. So if I play the track during kind of the busier moments, you'll be able to see that just kicks in. So I'm just gonna play that now. So you can just see it kicking in. It's not a lot of limiting um, because I'm already using a limiter on the drums, which is kind of keeping those in control. I tend to leave plenty of headroom in the mix so I can really bring it up. So that's kind of with a 4.5 dB gain on the output. And then there'll be a 3, D, 3 dB gain on top of that um, just to kind of bring it up a bit more. Um, so that is quite a lot of, of limiting, but I've, I've, provided enough band, I've provided enough headroom to actually allow for that kind of more extreme bump. Um, so yeah, I'm Drabbit has said, uh, Selig units all over are, are handy. I think they are the best tools made for a reason. They're really good. I have a real soft spot for anything that has pretty much a single purpose and does it incredibly well. And yeah, I, yeah, Selig stuff is, is awesome for that. I really, really like Selig gain is, I tend to use that all over my stuff. Um, and it's great for, for comparing levels between tracks and that kind of thing and DS is awesome and Leveler is fantastic. They're all they're all great. Um, Monkey++ has said, I saw someone use DS to only send a specific frequency band to ascend. That's a really good idea, actually. Um, I'm not entirely sure how DS works, but it's it, it does and it's awesome. It's also really, really good for removing guitar squeaks and that kind of thing and, and kind of fret noise, which is incredibly useful. Um, so yeah, worth trying if you haven't tried that before. Um, so yeah, something else I changed with this track is I adjusted the fade at the end of the track. So there's a like a master fade. So it kind of kicks in a little bit sooner because I think in the original track, it kind of came in more towards the end and it just kind of rushed the ending. I didn't want to extend the fade out too much. Um, it's always a bit of a balancing act, kind of getting getting a fade out right in a track. So I think originally it, it sort of came in a bit too late and it just, it just seemed a bit rushed. So I just adjusted that slightly. So going back to the disperser, that's actually something I added the day after. So if I just solo the redrum channel and open up one of these blocks, um, I think um, I've applied it to every, all the drums. It's everything's going through that disperser. So what the disperser does is, I've, I'm pretty sure I've described this incorrectly before, so I'm actually not gonna bother trying this time. I'd suggest looking it up if you're interested, um, but I, I can't really do, do it justice. It involves all pass filters and it's basically sorcery. So I'm just gonna play it. And um, it basically kind of, smears um, the and it smears it's any signals going into it. So it cut, you kind of end up with a sort of more rounded sound. So I'm just gonna kind of play the drums and you'll be able to hear what I mean. So I'm gonna crank it up and you'll really hear it. So you can kind of hear it's it's kind of like got a bit of a sort of punchy sort of boom kind of sound to it. Whereas if I turn it off, that's what it sounds like before. So if we turn that on, so that's obviously quite extreme. So how it was before, so that just adds a little bit of roundness, nothing too perceptible, but it just kind of helps it sit in the mix. The great thing about Disperser is it doesn't affect the amplitude of the signal going into it. So if you've got a perfectly healthy signal going into it and you make it sound a little more punchy, you're still not adjusting the, you're not sort of actually messing with the mix really. It, it should still sit correctly. Um, Monkey Plus Plus has said, I thought it delayed certain frequency bands or something. I thought that's how it worked, um, but I, I'm still, like, I, I doubt myself every time I explain it. So I feel like instead of me explaining it incorrectly, I'm just going to say, look it up because <laughs> it's really good. It is, I, I describe it as my kind of secret source. I use it on a lot of tracks if I want them to have that kind of sort of more rounded but punchy kind of feel to it. And it works really well on synths as well. So you can kind of get this really nice kind of punch um, behind, not not so much punch like pow, but kind of punch like punch. It's it kind of, it's really hard to describe is what I'm saying. Um, so yeah, definitely worth checking out if you've not used it before. And as pointed out in the chat, it is on sale right now. So definitely check it out. Um, 
Another thing I changed during the end of the track, and this is kind of a neat trick that I sometimes use, is I added an extra snare to the end of the track that wasn't there before. So if we go to block three, I'm just gonna leave that as it is. So there's no snare at the moment because I've muted the snare channel. So if I unmute that, So that's great and all, but I already had the track written and I couldn't be bothered to go back and actually add those individual snare hits manually. So all I did was mute the channel and unmute it when I want the snare to play. And instead of having to sequence everything, I just flipped the rack around and took the CV out, CV gate out from channel two and put it into the CV in on channel five. So now when I trigger channel two, it will trigger both channels which is incredibly useful. So if you wanna layer up your drums, that's a really, really easy way of doing it if you're using redrum. Um, so I also added a bit of a fade into the drums at the beginning of the track. So if we just have a look here, originally I think that just kind of came in as loud as possible. So I'm just gonna mute that and you'll be able to hear what I mean. So it just seems a bit like when the track starts, that's a bit overbearing. So I just give it a little fade. Just simple automation curve there. Um, I also added a drum filter fade in sort of around bar 39 here, I believe. So, so before it kind of sounded, it just kind of all kicked in and it just sounded a bit weird. Um, it just kind of came in suddenly. Uh, Dravi has asked, Adam, question on work workflow. When you're making changes to a song you did on the stream, are you keeping a change log or are you remembering what you did just off the top of your head? I'm not that good. <laughs> no, I, I keep a log of everything I've changed. So I am actually, I'm using a gigantic cheat sheet at the moment. So I'm just gonna bring that over and you can kind of see all the notes I've made. So yeah, so this is all the stuff that I've changed throughout the track and I'm kind of explaining what I did. Um, but yeah, I, I do that for all of my stream tracks just because it's nice to kind of know how things change. I feel like this is a an integral process. It's an integral part of how the tracks turn out. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not good enough to remember all of these changes, unfortunately, <laughs> especially considering the fact this was written on the 23rd of July. Um, and I've got another few to go through as well. So um, yeah, so I, uh, I added a few fades and I also adjusted the EQ on uh, the substance percussion, which is here. Um, so originally, I think I just I just had those kind of flat and it just sounded a bit harsh, quite brittle. Um, Drabbit said, do you save the original stream file or is it just over overwritten? I keep the original stream files. I, I do, I have absolutely everything. Um, so I've got the original stream files and the changes. Um, so yeah, I, I tend to copy the stream files straight away, keep those archived. Um, Tom has asked, is it better to log it or save files with different versions? Um, I mean, I do both. I, I just make a log so I can kind of explain what I'm doing. Um, yeah, so it's kind of, it's a fun way of comparing versions as, as Dravis just pointed out. Um, so yeah. In fact, that will be a really interesting thing to do during a future stream. Hmm. So, <laughs> um, so I talk about all this stuff, but I don't actually, I don't tend to compare the two, which I think would be quite interesting. Um, so, um, I also, I kind of brought up the Roydos percussion, which is this thing here, because it was a little quiet before. Um, Tree Zero has said, I wish we had some kind of version control, something like Git in the music making world. I would love, so this is kind of a, a, a feature suggestion that I would absolutely love to see in Reason, is versioning it per, in Reason files. So you have one Reason file that stores all the changes you've made. You, you can save new versions within the same Reason file. Um, Studio One lets you do that with project files for when using the project view, which is incredibly useful. So you can go back, if you're working on a master for a particular project, you can work, you can compare revisions and kind of go back and forward in time. It's super useful, super, super useful. Um, but you know, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, so I brought up the Roydos percussion and I added some reverb to the filter percussion and that's that's pretty much all I changed with the with the drums. Um, Tom has said use Dropbox. I mean, that's also an idea, but I I don't know. I like it's always kind of unreliable when you're working on a on a track, especially in Windows, which locks the file when you're actually using it. Um, so basically, when you're working on a Reason project, nothing can really touch it, which is a bit annoying. 
Um, so I, I tend to be very careful with my versioning with Reason, and I, but it's which is great until you're working with when you're working on a mix in Reason using all audio tracks, you end up with sort of 10 gigs worth of the exact same track over and over and over again, uh, which is not ideal. So that's why I'd love to see versioning in individual Reason files because it would be tidier in terms of organization and also much much smaller, much more efficient. Um, so there we go. <laughs> um, Dravit has said, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe integration with Splice, like most other doors have via Splice. Yeah, that'd be kind of nice. <laughs> I just want to see some kind of versioning. It would be super, super useful. Uh, so, yeah, so um, that's that's that. I've already explained kind of what I changed with the bass, which was I just turned off the chorus. So I'm just going to compare that. So this is the bass. So originally I had the chorus on, it just kind of makes it sound a bit watery, I think has less definition. So it just has a bit more kind of substance to it with the with the chorus turned off in my opinion. And also because I'm using beatmap, that's just gonna keep triggering percussion in the background while I'm soloing stuff outside of the mixer because of course. Um, so the lead, the lead, uh, someone mentioned the lead uh, in the chat while I was actually listening. And that is this thing. So that's just an instance of the legend, and yeah, I, I, I really like that patch. It's a it's a patch I've had kicking around for ages, and I've never really found an excuse to use. Um, so one thing I did was I increased, well, sorry, I reduced the delay feedback throughout the entire track because before it just kind of washed over everything, which sounded really cool to me when I was working on it. But listening back to it the following day, I was like, I feel like the mix could do with a bit more room, so I'm just going to dial back the feedback. And you can see it's already pretty high at 81% here. Um, so, I mean, it's automated, but that's kind of the base value is 81%, which is quite a high value for, for delayed feedback in general. Um, so, yeah, I also increased the release here as well, because I think before I had the amp end release quite low, so it just sounded a bit kind of... It just didn't sound as smooth on those those kind of tails at the end of each note, um, so I just kind of bumped that up, and it gave it a bit more bit more presence. Um, I also brought that up because it's kind of, it's the lead, and before it was getting kind of a bit lost in the mix, so I just kind of bumped that up and uh, set it to poly eight mode as well because originally I think I had it set to monophonic. So basically, every time I wouldn't, I wasn't getting any of those lovely kind of release tails on any of the notes because they were just being cut off by the following notes, which wasn't what I wanted really. Um, so Buskin Bills has asked, uh, "What are you drinking tonight?" Um, I'm just on the water tonight. Um, just been feeling a bit bit knackered recently, so I thought, play it safe. Don't want to get hammered during my stream. <laughs> um, yeah, still discussing versioning. Um, Shell Gratuit has said, can't the rack extension version of Spire have the six effects enabled at once? It can. Um, if I go over to Spire again, uh, yeah, it's just a drop down menu here, which again is kind of fiddly. There's lots of drop down menus, and but not where it counts. Like there isn't a drop down menu for the oscillator. You have to click and drag, which is awful. It's such a bad way of working. <laughs> um, so like I said, I love it as a synth and I'm sure the VST version doesn't have any of these problems, but it's like you can't just click and have a drop down menu of the filters. You've got to click and drag and it's ugh, hate it. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a pain to work with, but it sounds great and that's why I keep using it. Um, maybe one of these days I'll look at cross grading to the, to the VST version. Uh, oh, I think you have to click and drag the wavetable select on the VST as well. Oh man, that sucks. Um, Jalik76 has asked, is that a preset that comes with Legend or is it one you made? That is one I made, um, not during the stream. I tried to make a similar kind of patch during the stream, but it didn't turn out so well. So I just ended up firing up a patch I had lying around and it sounded pretty similar and sounded nice. So yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely, at some point I do want to check out the VST version. Um, so I also added some octaves during the final section. So because I'd set it to, um, because I'd set it to polyphonic mode, I could add extra octaves to the to the end of the track. So we get. So at the end of the of the track originally, it just kind of it didn't really have that extra punch that I really wanted. There was it didn't have a snare, it didn't have that extra octave on top, and this is kind of stuff that I think it sounded good during the stream. 
but it was kind of missing something and it was only the following day that I realized oh yeah it, it could do with a bit of a bit of a punch there um so looking at the vocals as well so there's some some vocals that I recorded during the stream as well so it was very simple stuff um Originally, I didn't have any compression or anything like that on, on either of the vocal channels. So I ultimately ended up adding a RE2A to both vocal channels, just with the vocals preset. It's kind of a quick and dirty solution. Tends to work for me, especially on these kind of simple uh, vocal washes. Um, and that kind of helped to, to sort of tame the dynamic dynamic range of both channels because um, originally they kind of wobbled all over the place which wasn't so great from a mixing perspective um, I've also added a 6 dB gain to both channels using the channel EQ why I did that instead of using the input gain um, I'm not entirely sure to be honest <laughs> um, that's that's a mystery for for me a month ago but I can't actually remember why I did that I'm sure there was a good reason for it uh, Monkey Plus Plus has said, uh, RE2A, could you recommend a good replacement for that? Um, oh, I, I can't really. I'm, I think there are some other uh, similar clones, um, but I I tried, I've used the Cakewalk, I'm sorry, I've, I've used the VST equivalent. Um, some people swear it sounds different. I haven't used it enough to really be able to decide one way or the other. Um, but that was released free a while ago, but I, I think that's been discontinued as well. So I don't think that's particularly useful. Um, there's a Waves one as well. And I think there's a UA Audio one as well. Uh, Drabbit said Black Rooster VLA2A. Yep. So any, basically if there's anything out there that's like, the, that's modeled on the LA2A, um, then yeah, give it a go. Um, it will probably be quite similar, but I, I'm a big fan of the uh, RE2A in Reason. It's great. It's one of the, the earlier rack extensions I picked up and I'm super glad I did. Um, so yeah, I also reduced the feedback frequency and filter on the high vocal delay because I think it was a bit harsh originally. So I just adjusted the filter there and um, also I think I reduced the feedback as well. Um, so, because again, it was just washing completely over the mix and overwhelming everything. Um, Buskin Bill, as I said, boo waves. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> that's a that's a whole other topic. I have a lot of a lot of waves plugins. I think I've only ever paid for one, um, and that was a I think it was the SSL G bus compressor because I wanted to use that in Studio One, and now I can just use the Reason Rack plugin and instead, and it's much much better, and I don't have to use their authenticator. But that's a whole other thing. So, <laughs> um, Drabbit said it's $40 at Black Rooster, but they have a whole suite for $126. It's basically a waves replacement. That sounds good. Um, I still need to check out Magnetite, actually. That, that came up during last week's stream. Um, so, yeah. Um, and one extra thing I changed was, so this is a, a something I tend to do, especially when I come back to mix a track after the fact. Um, I muted the this kind of pad here, which is this sort of, textural pad um, during the final parts of the song just because you couldn't really hear them and if you can't hear an element and it's not really contributing anything to the mix what you're doing is stealing headroom from yourself which could be used for the rest of the mix to kind of help it sit correctly um, so I just muted that it's always kind of a bit of a balancing act deciding what you want to mute and what you want to keep because you don't want to mute most of the track because you'll end up with a ghost of a track um, but it's nice to kind of just remove those elements that you don't need to let other elements come through. So I, I removed that element so I could let the lead uh, octaves shine through. So yeah, and that's that's pretty much all I changed with that particular track. Um, yeah, uh, Drabbit said, that's one of the biggest selling points of Reason, if you ask me everywhere else, you pay for the SSL suite that's built into Reason. Yeah, it's it's great. That's the one thing I absolutely miss when I use other doors is the SSL mixer. It's just so good just to have all the controls available on every channel without having to use plugins or even think about it because you know how much I use the the filters alone um, and I've used a couple of the compressors and I, I doubt it, it would just be a complete workflow, workflow killer for me to have to use plugins and pop out windows and stuff like that. So yeah, um, so I'm just gonna just gonna get rid of this and move on to the next track, which is Storm Approach, which was written on the 13th of August. So I'm just gonna play that from start to finish and I will do the same thing that I've just done, which is 
discuss the track and go over it and stuff like that. Um, so there's some there's some really really good uh, really good suggestions for stuff in in the chat. So oh um, I'm Drabitz who said I just noticed you're not mixing into the master comp. I'm not actually, and um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure why I'm not doing that during these streams. I think it's just because I tend to use other stuff for compression or saturation, like the analog heat, I tend to use that. Um, yeah, I just I just don't tend to use it a whole lot these days. And even when I do use it, I tend to use quite a light touch. So just to kind of give an example of how I would use it, um, if I just play a bit of this track, I kind of turn it on. Basically, when I use the master compressor, I tend to, I, I'll not bring down the makeup gain just because I don't tend to use it. And I'll just adjust it, adjust it so that it's kind of sitting somewhere between sort of naught and 4 dB cut. Um, just because I feel like it's nice to add kind of a little bit of smoothness, but I don't tend to, to want to overdo it. Um, but I know a big part of the appeal of using it is that it kind of adds a really nice, uh, nice kind of flavor to the sound. So sometimes it, it is best to use a, a kind of harder approach. Um, so, uh, Gruza3, apologies again if I'm butchering your name, uh, why not delete instead of muting? Um, just because I was using blocks at the time. So, um, if I go back to the track, it's a good thing I didn't close it. Uh, if I go back here, um, so you can see it's it's just in the, those blocks itself, so it was just easier for me to, to use the mute tool and mute those. And also it means if I change my mind later, I can just unmute those and they're ready to go. So that's that's why I did that, just mainly because I was using the because I was using blocks. But sometimes I'll mute elements if I'm unsure about whether I want to keep them or not. If I'm not using blocks, um, it's a really good way of working. So, right. So I'm going to play Storm Approach, which is I'd say it's the first track from the next batch of uh, of live stream tracks. So Midnight Circuits is kind of the end of the previous batch, and a Storm Approach is the start of the next lot. So I'm just going to play it through from start to finish. And again, if you have any questions or anything you'd like me to, to look into uh, as I talk about the track, please let me know via the chat and I'd be more than happy to, to go into it. So here we go.
So that is Storm Approach. So um, just checking the chat, um, had a couple of comments pop up. Uh, Jlex76 says, any chance you would ever do a studio walkthrough of all your gear? I'm a gearhead and always interested in what people use in their studios. So. Um, to be honest with you, I feel like that would be kind of underwhelming in my instance. I don't have a huge amount of gear. I'm very much an in-the-box kind of person. So it's very much, for the most part, what you see is what you get. Um, everything else I'm using is... Uh, I tend to only use outboard gear that is easy to use with a decent software sort of integration. So basically I've got a virus snow, which has the virus plugin, which is incredibly, incredibly useful. So you can just use it kind of like a soft synth really. Um, the analog heat has an overbridge plugin, so you can just use that literally like any other plugin. It's awesome. Um, the only out piece of outboard gear that I'm using now that doesn't fit that bill is the Lyra 8, and that is awesome. Um, but that's, I feel like at some point I should have like a little showcase on that or, or do something more involved because I've, I'm using it kind of more for sound design stuff at the moment than anything else, but you can do some awesome stuff with that. And it's a very expressive instrument to play. Um, so, uh, Buskin Bills has said, you got any book recommendations? I love a good book. Um, any particular pre preference? Uh, Dravit said genre preference, which I'm assuming is in, in relation to that. Um, non, non music or so, um, I've, I haven't really read a lot of, um, a lot of sort of music books really, to be honest with you. Um, I've realized that sounds kind of terrible, but a lot of the stuff I tend to read is mostly online. So, um, or watching videos or stuff like that. So. Um, the, I've just finished read, reading a book called, because I love gaming, I read a book called Extra Lives, which is an awesome book about kind of the gaming industry and and uh, how certain games were kind of, like the, the sort of emotional attachment behind certain games and how they can do better kind of thing. Really, really interesting. Um, big fan of anything by Philip K. Dick, really. Um, finished uh, Man in the High Castle about a month ago. That's a really good book. Um, yeah, so I can't, I can't really think of anything on the top of my head, but I'll get back to you on that one. Um, Masters of Doom that's an excellent book if you're into games and Doom in particular um, so Drabbit said love the lead on that um, yeah that's another instance where I've just used monotone as a lead instead of a bass synth which it's kind of labelled as so yes that's, that's the monotone bass synthesizer which I always find quite funny Some good book recommendations in the chat. To be honest with you, I don't really read enough generally, so I should. That's something I've, I meant to sort of look into during during lockdown, and I just haven't. I've just spent my evenings playing too much Stardew Valley instead. Um, so yeah, <laughs> bad me. Um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of nice. So again, in this track, I kind of adjusted the levels and sort of brought it up in line with the other stream tracks I'd written. So again, if I were to kind of adjust the M-Class maximizer how it was before, set that to minus, I set that to 4.5, which it is in the actual finished project and bring that down to minus 1.5. You'll be able to see it kind of just kicks in during the, the busier part of the tracks, of the busier parts of the track. Um, so if I just... See, it's just kind of kicking in. That's kind of a very, very rough way of working during these stream tracks. Um, I tend to put in a more involved approach when I'm not when I'm not doing stuff like this. If I'm using more than just the maximizer, but so far it's actually worked really nicely. Um, Jalex said, um, "I love that you don't get track heavy. Ma makes mixing much easier, in my opinion." Um, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I actually, that's it's kind of interesting because how I used to work was just to throw more and more stuff in. And if you watch some of my earlier streams, there's, there's quite a bit of that going on. Um, and as time's gone by, I seem to be kind of paring things back a bit, which is which is really really nice. Um, Buscoe says, just got a pocket piano chord dictionary with thirteen hundred chords in, nice and handy. That actually sounds pretty nifty. Um, so yeah, um, the only other major kind of change I made to the general levels was I notched the sub bass and the drums a bit. So the sub bass, which is this chappy, um, obviously it was quite hard for me wearing headphones to kind of get a rough idea of how loud that was in the context of everything else. So when I came back to it the following day and listened back to the track, I was like, whoa, that's way too loud um, using monitors. Uh, so yeah, I kind of just dialed that back a bit and that was super easy to do. The intro texture, I added a bit of pitch modulation. So 
um, in the grain of just a side LFO one to amp pan, so it kind of sw swishes around a bit uh, when you play the track. So, it, so it just kind of swishes around a little bit. If I were to crank that up, you'd be able to really hear it. So it just pans around all over the place. Very simple change, just kind of gives it a bit more movement in the intro. Um, the drums, again, I've kind of faded in some elements at the start. This is something I tend to overlook when I'm actually working on a track uh, during the stream. Um, so yeah, I'll just play that. That's not a particularly good example, actually. But basically, there were like th these little clicks that kind of just, they just sounded really sharp at the beginning. And uh, I seem to recall um, someone kind of mentioned they were a little too sharp during the stream, but it was harder for me to notice uh, during the stream. Very easy to spot after the fact. Um, I also turned down the shakers, which is that channel there, um, and the open hats, just because they're a bit overbearing. They should be there to kind of augment what's there already, whereas originally they were just like, tss, tss, it was really harsh. Um, Jalex76 says, Ableton's book, Making Music, is actually a really good read. I've got that kicking around somewhere and I still haven't read it, um, which is for shame, really. Um, yeah. So some excellent book recommendations in the chat. I feel like I should, I'm gonna have to come back and, and check these out. Uh, Shell Gratuit says, do you set a time limit for these tracks when you stream making them? I haven't, like, I've, I've never purposefully set myself a time limit, but generally speaking, I tend to aim for around two and a half hours-ish. Um, just because by that point I normally just want to finish and wrap up and um, and get it done. So it's, that's kind of a good rough guide. But when I first started out, it was just roughly about two hours. Uh, so yeah, about two uh, two hours to two and a half hours tends to be my sort of rough rough go to. That's that's kind of a good good place to go. Um, something else I did with the drums was I had well, I thought I'd done this. Um, the 20k attenuation on the Eve MP5. So if you're not using the Eve MP5 <laughs> Buskin pills, he's run out of beer or gin with two hours. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Night Monkey Folk says Pro Tools is worth learning. Um, I've, I've used Pro Tools before, but every time I, it's not something I would choose to use. I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> um, my mum always said, if you don't have anything nice to say about something, then don't say anything at all. So I'm going to gloss off over that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so something Thing I did with the drums is you might have noticed I use the Eve MP5 on everything and this is probably my favorite EQ in the Reason Rack at the moment. I use it on absolutely everything and that's because it's really really easy to do um, things that I do all the time um, and one of those things is to smooth things over. So if I solo the drum channel and play it I'm just going to play it with and without that 20k attenuation. So this is with and this is without. It just kind of sounds a bit harsh in the highs, like quite brittle, especially in conjunction with the pulverizer, which is kind of helping to accentuate those highs. So I decided to just to smooth it out with a 20K, that's on again. So it just smooths it out, makes it much more pleasant to listen to. And again, that's not really something that's that I could tell during the stream. It's something I noticed when I came back to it the next day, listened to it, and I was like, that sounds a bit harsh. Let's, let's dial that back a bit. Um, so yeah, that's something I tend to do. <laughs> um, Mitch Mood says, doesn't the other half get frustrated with your stream time? Not really, she's doing her own stuff. <laughs> um, she probably enjoys me not being around, having some time to herself. Everyone's a winner. <laughs> that makes it sound like I hate my wife. I really don't. Um, no, we, we haven't killed each other during lockdown. I feel like that's a, that's a successful marriage story. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so uh, keys. So um, something else I changed in the track was uh, I didn't actually change that much in this track, which is uh, surprising considering how kind of clicky some of the stuff in here is. Um, so it's mostly kind of the sub bass and the percussion. Um, if I go to the the uh, the monotone keys, I did change a few things here. Um, So originally I had way more reverb um, over that. So what I've done is I've got this really long reverb on the monotone, but it's 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 quite dry. So you don't tend to uh, you don't tend to get it completely washing over everything. Whereas if you turn it up, it would just be too much in the mix. That's way too much. So you dial it back. You get this really long reverb tail that kind of sits nicely in the back of the of the mix, and it's great. Um, 
ASM has said, with the EVE MP5, do you ever attenuate the low as well? The infamous Poltec trick. I do sometimes, but I very, very rarely do that. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's it's something I'm aware of, but something I don't tend to do a whole lot myself, which is odd. Um, but yeah, for those unaware, the Poltec trick is you can use the boost and attenuation knobs to like, if you, the way it works is they don't completely cancel each other out. So if you were to turn the boost up and the attenuation up, it would sound different to if you just had them turned down. It's hard to explain, so I'm just gonna solo the drums and you'll be able to hear for yourself. Uh, unless. So if we kind of go to 16, kind of. So that will sound different to how it will if I just pull those right back. So it's hard to explain. And again, I'm wearing headphones, so it's hard for me to actually hear the difference. Um, so yeah, but I don't tend to use it a whole lot, which is strange um, because that's kind of one of the, the major things that the the uh, MP5 and the, the Portec compressor, uh, Portec EQ has kind of got going for it. So uh, <laughs> drab it. I use my stats to shut the misses down. Uh, <laughs> Is this the way you speak to a man who has literally tens of fans? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to use that. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so yeah, I, I notched the reverb slightly on the uh, on the keys. Going back to, to what, I was, what I was talking about before, and the uh, the filter at the end, um, I kind of notched that a bit because it was quite kind of washy. So I've got this kind of got this section at the end. I think it's during this section where I kind of open up the filter a bit, but I opened it up too much, so it just kind of... It just washed over everything a bit too much, especially with the extra effects kind of piled on top of it. Um, and I also added these extra keys to the fade out, just because I, originally those weren't there. I think they weren't there right at the end. And I kind of like it just kind of tailing off there, and it was... that was nice. Um, oh, Clobber says, my husband is my biggest fan. I feel like I lucked out there. That's really lovely. I mean, my wife doesn't hate what I do, so that's good. <laughs> We're both very supportive of each other, and that's that's great. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much all I did with the keys. Just made a couple of slight tweaks. Um, again, with the vocals, I did the exact same thing that I did in the previous track. I didn't have any compression going on on the actual vocals themselves, so I just slapped in a RE2A and set it to vocals and Bob's your uncle, it was done. So, uh, <laughs> Mitch Mood, my wife was my biggest fan. We're 11 years in, she's over it. Oh, <laughs> oh man, that's 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 a tragedy. <laughs> well, she'll come around, damn it. <laughs> um, so something else has changed as well, the, uh, the sub bass and kick. Um, I basically, originally, I had those, um, uh, playing all throughout. So I, I had like, I added these extra mutes so that it just kind of pairs it back a bit as the uh, as the track ends. That's pretty much what I did in that track really. It's remarkably faithful to how it was originally. And yeah, I, I really like how that turned out. Again, th this track in particular is when I was working at the time and I was like, I kind of like how that turned out. Um, and I think one thing I really like about where it went is that I wanted to do something different from Midnight Circuits and all the tracks I'd done before. So there's no nasal riser or, or bin rise and stuff like that. I did use some vocals because I sort of cheated there, but I tried to sort of think outside the box a little bit, sort of not relying too much on on some of the tropes I've used throughout throughout my stream so far and kind of familiar techniques. Um, so, you know, using more kind of clicky percussion and sub bass and that kind of thing instead of just simple bass drones. And, you know, a lot of that has kind of fed into stuff that I've done since then. And it's nice to to be able to hear the difference between the tracks that I wrote before this one and after. Um, I feel like it's it's been kind of nice to just go in a bit of a different direction and try some stuff out. Um, so that leads me nicely onto the next track, which is Sundial, which I'll get into in a second. So um, also I'm really, really chuffed that uh, all the tracks here uh, haven't brought my computer to its knees, even though I've left everything open, which is always a bit of a risky move. So I'm just gonna set that to how it was before. Um, so I'm just gonna play through, so I'm just checking the chat again. 
Dravid. I am waiting for the day when my ESO comes in and says, babe, I love you, but that snare sounds like ass. Compress it or go do the dishes. <laughs> Jalex76. Is it me or is this chat turning into a session in marriage counselling? I am content for you guys to just, just work out your issues in the chat. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Um, so, yeah. My wife's been baking lots of stuff during lockdown, which is fantastic. I also coincidentally took up running, and I feel like if I hadn't been running, I would have Put on quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of weight during lockdown, <laughs> so it's a hard life. It's a hard life. She looks after me. Um, so Buskin Bills, the missus was well pleased. You picked the name she suggested for this one. Yeah, I really like it. I think it really fits. And also, um, I uh, I really really like coincidentally. <laughs> I I really like the kind of uh, contrast between the last one, which was Storm Approach and Sundial. So Storm Approach, I wrote that when it was kind of stormy outside. And, you know, I thought that was that was kind of cool. Um, and Sundial, the following week, it was really, really sunny. And I kind of like the sort of contrast between the two. And it, it kind of... One thing I really like about writing music quickly is it kind of has this really nice time capsule sort of element to it, where you write it so quickly that you sort of, you don't latch onto it as something you've spent ages laboring over. Um, you listen back to it and it kind of takes you back to when you wrote it. And I, I really, really like that. Uh, club them up. Best advice for a happy marriage. Boost at 12k. Go easy on compression on the master bus. <laughs> It served me well. It served me well for a few years. Uh, Buskinville, she was showing our daughter last weekend when she came over with the grandson. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. Um, yeah, it's a good name. I really like it. And like I said, I think it fits really nicely thematically. So so give her a thank you from me. Um, Tom, well, my wife after my music battle just said, what was that? <laughs> Yeah, I've had a few of those. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to play the track from start to finish. And again, if you've got any questions about the track throughout and you're not sort of working through your marriage issues, then <laughs> please let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll just go through this, the changes I've made. And there's a few more this time. So here we go. This is Sundial.
So yeah, I really like how that track turned out. Um, Drabit mentioned the lead during the uh, during the track, and again, that's an instance of monotone. So again, I one thing I really like about, especially with this track being called Sundial, is it kind of works as a sort of counter to uh, Storm Approach, which is totally unintentional. But uh, yeah, but um, yeah, so I've used a very similar kind of lead sound, but with a bit of a tweak and some similar techniques as well. So we've got that kind of really nice atmospheric sound at the start, which is. Uh, that really nice thing, but again, it's a very similar technique to what I used in Storm Approach, which is an instance of grain um, and messing around with that. Um, so yeah, just checking the uh, the chat. Um, uh, Busker Bill says got an ad right in the middle of the stream. That sucks. I'm I'm gonna have to check that out because um, you probably shouldn't be getting ads. I I got the impression I was supposed to trigger those on my end, and I'm definitely not. Um, Really nice track, but I would not have added the hi hat. Um, well, <laughs> you win some, you lose some, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, Mitch Mood says, "Oosh, those notes at the end are like silk." Yeah, I, I wanted to say thank you so much to whoever it was who suggested um, using this uh, as Falls Victoria Falls up as well, because that really adds a lovely element to the track. And that's literally just a preset from the Factory Sound Bank. You know, I wouldn't have even thought of of doing that. Um, Shall to it says stream elements can trigger some on a timer as in adverts. I should look into that. Thank you, for, thank you for that. Um, stream elements uh, disable. So yeah, that was that was really really cool. Um, ASM says was Rad a piano added later after the original stream? No, that's that's the exact same as it was in the original stream. So I did something really interesting with the radical piano during the track, which is I automated the character as the track goes on, so it kind of gets more intense as the track goes on. It kind of sounds more agitated. Um, the strings are more agitated, so it kind of takes on a more dramatic sound. So at the end of the track, it sounds like this. Whereas at the start, it sounds like this. Both the exact same note sequence, same velocity, nothing's really changed there. It's purely just um, the automation of the character, which was really nice. I've never actually tried that before, so that was a really nice experiment there. Um, so generally speaking, um, actually, I just want to see if there's any anything else. Um, yeah, so yeah, so... Um, one thing I changed was I notched the bass and the kick a little, so I had the exact same problem again, where the kick and the bass were just too loud. I just couldn't really tell wearing cans at the time. Came back to it the following day and I was like, those are too loud. I'm just gonna bring those back a bit. Um, with stuff like that, I tend to just kind of go from my gut, gut instinct from just listening back. Um, and if my feeling is straight away listening back, if I think something's too loud, I'll just bring it back. Or if something's too quiet, I'll just bring it back up. Um, so originally it was quite over overwhelming and I just thought, yeah, let's, let's just pull that back a bit. So with the lead through the track, um, I actually did something different. I showed this off during the stream, um, but I've used the monotone as a polyphonic synth using distributor. So it's a monophonic synth by itself, but if you create several in instances of it and use distributor, you can actually program it and write polyphonic parts, which is exactly what I did during this track. So later on, you get these kind of falls over the top. Which you wouldn't be able to do that if you just had one instance of monotone. So you, I thought that was really, really neat. And I've actually got this combinator patch, which I've been using quite a bit since then. So it just kind of opens up the possibilities of monotone a little bit more. And it's one thing I really like about Reason um, is the fact that there's normally a workaround if you if there's something that you want to kind of change. In this instance, I wanted to change monotone from being a monophonic synth to being a polyphonic synth. There's normally a solution somewhere. Um, so. Yeah, so it, over the years I've used all kinds of weird techniques like um, uh, tweaking kind of like using the NN19 as like a sort of semi-granular synth and stuff like that. There's, there's, it's just it's weird kind of finding solutions to problems using a very limited tool set. And obviously things have expanded a lot now since um, since VSTs and plugins have been introduced. Um, Claude Mutt says that synth there makes me think of Full Circle. Wow, that is an old track. Uh, if you haven't heard that, that's a tune I wrote in like 2003 or 2004. I ended up remixing it and it's on one of my uh, archive albums, which is on my Bandcamp page if you're a subscriber or on my Patreon page if you're a Patreon, if you're a patron rather. Um, speaking of which, if you haven't checked out my Patreon page, you totally should because there's a lot of tasty stuff on there. Um, 
so yeah so that was a lot of fun to kind of just mess around with that and change it um i also adjusted the levels again to kind of bring it in line with the other tracks so if i play the track again you'll just see the limiter just kicking in So it just kicked in a little bit there, and this is kind of like that throughout the track. Um, and I also added a bar at the start for kind of an extra bar of the kind of for the for the sort of intro pad to kind of fade in, because originally it just kind of came in with everything else, and it just sounded a bit off. Um, and it didn't push the track over four minutes, which I was also sort of secretly hoping for, but never mind, <laughs> just under four minutes. But sometimes, you know, it's good to it's good to know when to keep things sort of more concise and not let them outstay their welcome. And just under four minutes is a good length for a track anyway, uh, especially of this kind. So um, with the monotone poly, I actually changed a couple of things here. Um, I added a low pass filter to the start and I adjusted the DR1 in here to kind of sound a bit more bit more natural really, um, well especially with the filter. So in the intro you'll be able to hear um, there is a low pass filter that kind of just... So originally I think that was missing, it just kind of, it just suddenly came in and it just sounded weird and quite unnatural. Um, so yeah, I, I adjusted the um, the reverb, I think I might have not notched it a little bit because uh, again it was kind of washing all over the mix. And I also turned it down because originally, again, it was just way too loud. And that was one of those sort of instinctual things listening back to it where I was like, it's too loud. Let's just bring it back and kind of go from there. Um, generally speaking, when I'm mixing stuff, a good rule of thumb is I'll set a level for the bass. If I can balance the kick and the bass, um, then I can generally kind of balance everything else around that. That's kind of a good starting point. And if you kind of look at the mixer as the track's playing, I think the, the kick and the bass will hover around the kind of minus 10 dB mark. Yeah. So they both hover around the minus 10 dB mark and I've just kind of balanced everything else around that. And that's just a really, really good good way of working. Uh, Tom has asked Adam, could we do some kind of remix of your works? I'll get to that in a sec. As far as these stream tracks are concerned, yeah, absolutely, go for it. Yeah, we'd love to hear anything that anyone comes up with. Um, the project files are all in Dropbox. Um, if you're a patron, I'm gonna stop shilling for my Patreon page in a second, but if you're a patron, I'm planning on sharing all of the stems for these tracks uh, as audio with producer pat patrons. So if you don't have all the rack extensions or anything, or you wanna use a different door, you can. It will just all be straight up audio and you can just mess around with that. Um, so yeah, that's that's my plan. If you've yeah, if you want to mess around with any of these tracks, by all means, please, I'd I'd love to hear what you come up with. Um, yeah, yeah, go for it. And if you know, if you don't fancy becoming a patron and you just want the, if you're missing something, just drop me a message and I'll probably just bounce it as audio or whatever. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, so that's pretty much all I all I did with the with the monotone poly, just add a filter. And turn it down really. Um, the percussion, there was some kind of, there was some percussion, like the organic percussion I think. That was fun, I liked, I liked doing that. Um, so I actually turned, oh wait this is not the one I wanted, it's like a glitchy percussion channel somewhere. Uh, this is the problem with coming back to stuff after you've written it. Oh yeah there's this whole glitchy percussion section. There we go. Is it this? I was really happy with how that turned out, by the way, using stutter edit combined with an instance of uh, evolution. That was really, really neat. Um, so I've got written down here, I turned down the amp env decay and level. So I turned down the level, but there is no amp. Oh yeah, I forgot I used a Kong for this. Um, so yeah, I'm looking at the completely wrong channel here. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I forgot I'd created an instance of Kong that kind of did this. Uh, where does it come in? I'm just confused now as to, I think I've just got the wrong channel mute, uh, unmuted. Anyway, I'll, I'll try and find it in the mixer. Glitchy percussion, there we go. So yeah, this was really cool. It just used a bunch of factory soundbank sounds on this one pad. 
you just ended up with uh, some glitches. Basketball says you need to do glitches with grain next. Yeah, I love using grain for that kind of stuff. It's it's really really cool, and um, I, th I feel like kind of the intro textures in these past two tracks sort of get sort of roughly approximate to that idea. Um, but one thing I really like doing, and I've been doing recently, I'll show it off in the when I get to the next track. Um, but it's adjusting the stretch algorithm to get kind of a more granular sound. Um, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, you've just reminded me, so thank you, thank you, Buskin Bills. I'll just make a note of that. Um, show off stretch algorithms. So yeah, so uh, I just adjusted the decay of this because I think it was either too short or too long. I can't remember because I haven't actually written it down, which is not very useful. Um, I've also adjusted the level because I think originally it was too loud. Um, and I've also put a fade at the start of the track so it fades in. So generally speaking, I think with this track in particular at the start, everything just kind of came in suddenly and it was just, it just kind of threw you off a bit. You need to kind of establish some sense of, uh, of rhythm before you start bringing in other elements. Otherwise, you know, the listener will just be like, that just came from nowhere and it's weird and it just, I can't latch onto anything. It's good to have something to latch onto at the start, like even if it's like a slight rhythmic pulse, um, just to kind of latch onto. Otherwise it's just like a, whoa, this is, this is weird and I don't like it. Um, which can work, but for what I'm, what I was doing here, it didn't. Um, Jalex says, saw what you did with Ryan's banjo track a few weeks ago on Reason Live Stream and it was amazing. Would you be willing to listen and help produce other people's music maybe through Patreon? That is exactly what I do via the producer category. So if you become a producer patron over on my Patreon page, um, I basically, you can chuck me one track a month, I'll listen to it and I'll tell you what I think and what I would change basically. Um, so yeah, I don't do mixing or production work or anything like that. It's purely a um, critical analysis so I will tell you what I think um, and yeah that's basically it so you can do that once a month and yeah be be happy to um, so yeah check out check out my patreon page There's, all this stuff is on there I'm, I'm doing a really rubbish job of, of publicizing my, my patreon so do do check it out there's some good stuff on there uh, samples and an absolute ton of music as well um, so yeah where was I where was I um, so yeah, I've um, just introduced a bunch of fades. I also turned down the organic percussion, which is this thing that I was actually listening to earlier. Um, and I can't hear it now because I've muted it. So that was really loud before. Um, yeah, Clobbermut has pointed out up to 18,000 channel points now, just so you know, like if you want to add some channel point stuff soon. I know, I need to do it. I've got some like rough ideas. I think it'd be cool to add like some extra sounds for people who have loads of channel points. Or I still need to get in touch with you, Dravit, about perhaps doing some emotes. Um, yeah, I need to, I really need to look into that and stop sucking. <laughs> Pro level segue there, Adam, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah, I suck. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all I did with the percussion. I just adjusted some fades and turned down the organic percussion. Let's move on. Let's move on to something else. Um, so, um, drums, I did adjust some of the drums. And the main thing is I turned up the clap on channel four. So that's this thing here. Originally, I think that was more subdued, but I really liked how kind of splashy that sounded. And it kind of, it's, it's one of my favorite sort of claps, which is just this really kind of smushy clapping sound, really loose, sloppy clap. So yeah, so I gave that a bump because it was kind of getting a bit lost with everything else. I also turned down the reverb on the snare, which is muted at the moment. So if I unmute that, Oh no, that's not the snare. There we go. So that's going into its own uh, line mixer channel here and it's got a bit of a deep reverb reverb on it. And originally I think that was way higher, so I think it was more like that. And it was just a bit much. Um, it was just kind of getting washed out. Um, so Dravid has asked, what do you all think we need as an emoji? Maybe a loon for the old FSB. So I was kind of thinking maybe having like some, some rack devices would be kind of cool. L a loon would be great. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much my thinking. It'd be awesome to have the classic purple RV7K just for old school reasons. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, so turn on the reverb on the snare and I also faded out the kick and the claps at the end of the track, which is this bit here. Because I think originally it just kind of, uh, it just sort of ended and it was just a bit weird. 
Um, so it's a lot of kind of little arrangement changes there, just kind of bringing stuff in and out. Um, the shakers, I didn't really change a lot. I just adjusted the fill to fade. Um, so it comes in here. And originally it was sort of the filter fade in was half the length of this section. Um, so I just kind of doubled that length so it comes in more gradually. Um, so yeah, and I also turned it down because originally they were quite high up. And although it's kind of nice to have in the background, when it's kind of in the foreground, it was, uh, it was just a bit too much. Um, So yeah, so that was that was pretty neat. Um, I will definitely have to shoot uh, Dravit a message at some point about doing uh, some stuff for to use the channel points because yeah, that's something I've been meaning to do for ages, and I really should sort it out. So um, expect a message after this. <laughs> that sounds like more of a threat than anything else. <laughs> um, so I also um, tweaked the uh, this sort of ARP thing that kind of comes in. Mitch Muda said, get your Patreon link, etc. on your website. Yeah, I need to update my site. It's it's pretty woefully out of date. Um, the problem is I, I like making music and I don't like updating my site, <laughs> but I need to just knuckle down and sort that out. Um, so I added an up to the end of the track here. Originally that wasn't there and I thought I was kind of missing a bit of a trick uh, there. <laughs> um, so Mitch Moose says I'm web dev if, if you need help. Um, I'm really, really kind of you to offer. I think I just need to be less lazy and actually update my site. Um, <laughs> I like I like where it is at the moment. I just need to update it because I'm lazy. Um, so I also turned down, there's um, an element in the ARP, which is this channel, which is the kind of, it's of this really harsh resonant pad. And um, and it's nice kind of in the background, but originally that was way louder and it just sounded really harsh in the mix. So I just kind of brought that back a bit. Again, that was more of a kind of listening to it and uh, and just being like, oh yeah, that sounds a bit off. So all this stuff was very, very sort of instinctual to, to tweak. Um, so <laughs> uh, yeah, so I also boosted the vocals and uh, extended the reverb length at the end of the, the sort of little vocal part that comes in. So if I can find that again, I almost every time I listen to this, I sort of forget that there's a vocal part because it sort of it sits really far in the mix. So at the end of this section, I've actually increased the reverb time. So you end up with this really big wash over everything else. So on its own, it sounds a little harsh, but in the context of the mix, I think it works. So it just kind of washes over everything else. I was really considering adding an extra note to the end of that. But then I thought, no, that's how I've written the track. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it how it is and just just mess around with the arrangement, not add anything else. Uh, Dravit says as a singer, good job on that last note. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sometimes I, I find it easier to sing the higher notes than I do to to do the lower notes. I think it's just kind of poor poor control, <laughs> basically. Um, whereas I think it's kind of enforced when you're when you're doing the higher notes. Um, so yeah, I um, I gave that a bit of a boost. Oddly enough, uh, originally it was quieter than that. So that's if you can if you can believe that. But it does kind of sit a bit further back in the mix. I also increased the high pass filter. Originally, um, I it was I didn't really have as much of a filter going on. It just it just didn't really add anything to the mix. So I thought just scoop that out a bit. Give give everything in the lows and, and the low mids a bit of a bit of a breather. So originally. Not that there's anything going on down there anyway, but. So yeah, that was that was fun. I also added a couple of risers to the track, which weren't there originally. So if I have a look at the sweep channel, um, if we have a look in the sequencer, I really, really didn't want to go overboard with this because like I said before, um, 
I really like, once I finish a, a stream track, I like to keep the arrangement as intact as I can um, and not mess around with elements too much. Um, although I'm totally going to go back on that statement very, very shortly when I look at the next track. Um, so yeah, so I added a couple of sweeps just before this section here and at the end of the end of this section. So I'm just going to play that so you can hear the difference. <laughs> So originally that, that sweep wasn't there and I, it just kind of came in a bit suddenly. I didn't really feel like the track was progressing as much as I wanted it to. So I just added that and I had a little, little riser to the end of that section as well, which is, I think it's literally just that, but stretched. Um, so again, I, I really didn't want to go overboard and there's only two little risers in the track. Um, and I felt like the track was fine without them before. It just needed that extra kind of oomph to sort of kick it up a notch. And I think that did the trick. So that is literally everything I changed in Sundial. Um, Buskin Bills asks, is your arrangement structure you've worked on, is your arrangement structure you've worked on or something you've gotten from TV, etc.? Um, I, 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 I'm assuming you mean like, is am I kind of following something that I've heard from like TV or something? Um, no, generally speaking, when I'm working on a stream track, it's more, it's generally just what I feel like doing at the time. Um, so when I'm working on production tunes, obviously I'll, I'll follow kind of the guidelines, basically, if someone wants me to I'll follow the spec. Um, whereas if I'm working on my own stuff, I'll just do whatever I fancy. And I, in the instance of all my, all my stream tracks, they've just kind of turned out the way they are. That's why we've ended up with stuff like, um, uh, oh, the name of that track that's that I did ages ago that ended up being like a seven and a half minute like progressive house track um that just kind of happened so um yeah generally speaking when i'm working on my own stuff even outside of the streams i'll just do however much i fancy doing and then when i've had enough i'll move on to something else um there's the whole thing people say like a, a track is like a piece of music is never really finished um i agree with that to a certain extent um but i yeah, I feel like I'm I'm getting better at kind of when I finish a track and move on to something else. I I do that seven minute track. I did. I totally did the seven minute track. That was the the trance track that I did. Um, Sunset Waves. That's the that's what it's called. I did it ages ago. Um, it was like the the progressive house track. Um, it definitely happened. I didn't just I didn't just hallucinate that, did I? <laughs> um, yeah, it definitely happened. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna move on to the next track in a second. Um, but yeah, I, I basically, I'll, I'll continue working on a track until I, I feel like I'm happy with it and it's not, I, I'm always, I always like to make tracks not outstay their welcome, if that makes any sense, which is sometimes hard, easier said than done. Um, so, oh, Clubma, I was just using that as an excuse to make a nasal reference. <laughs> the long snort good night yes indeed so oh it's been a while since i since i heard the nasal riser i haven't used any nasal risers in the past few tracks actually maybe it'll be maybe it'll be time to bring that back in my next track hmm so anyway i'm going to move on to the next track which is facing giants and i'm just going to tweak this again so i can highlight what i was talking about earlier oops i've done that wrong uh just bring that up and bring that down and um, I'm just going to play the track, and I will. I would say this is one of the most fun tracks I've written during this during these streams. Like I've really, really, really enjoyed writing this track to the point where um, I've been writing more jungle tunes since because I enjoyed it so much. It was a ton of fun. So I'm just going to play it from start to finish, and then we can talk about it some more. And that'll be that'll be fun. So here we go. I'll uh, just play it and keep quiet. So here we go. This is Facing Giants.
So yeah, mentioned this before, really, really, really enjoyed working on that. Um, so, had a really interesting question from Thor inside about how I pan stuff, which is really, it's a really good question. Um, basically, uh, Thor Inside's asked, do you ever mess with the pan and depth in the SSL mixer for channels, or do you mostly get stereo through reverb? So this is actually something I was gonna gonna mention in, uh, in a second. So you can see everything's panned in the center, but there's a lot going on in the stereo field. Um, generally speaking, if I'm working on stuff outside of streams, I'll, I'll tend to use the, the pan pots more extensively and the width knobs. They're, they're great for a nice little trick, kind of if you wanna have a track really explode, is to kind of reduce the width knob right before a part where you want everything to open up. That's actually a really easy way to do that. Um, and uh, But one thing I did in this track after the fact was if we look at the pure vocal uh, channel here, so that's this thing here. So you can kind of hear it sort of pans from right to left, but there's nothing actually going on in the in the mixer. So what's going on there? So I've basically taken a CV uh, output from the sub bass uh, subtractor, and I've stuck that in a, a spider CV splitter because I think I'm doing the same trick somewhere else. Uh, I think I'm doing it with the hats, and um, I've just taken the LFO CV signal and routed that to the pan CV input on the back of the pure vocal. So what you get is this really slow kind of s sort of sweeping panning effect without having to mess around with the pan pots. And the same's happening with the hi-hats. So if I just play the part with the rapid hi-hats, you'll be able to hear that. It kind of just goes to the left and then kind of sweeps around to the right. And because I'm using the inverse uh, CV output on, the, uh, on that kind of vocal atmospheric channel, 
it will be doing the inverse of whatever those hi-hats are doing. So when that's panned to the left, it pans to the right, which is interesting. Um, just checking out with checking out the chat. Um, Drum it said, maybe my favorite fielding drum beat so far, and most of them are banging. Thank you. That's awesome. And also I didn't cheat and use beat map. Um, but yeah, it was a ton of fun working on that amen break at the start. Um, so the first thing I did was just basically um, adjust the levels again so that it was in line with all the other tracks, blah, 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 that, all that stuff again. Um, and I, what one, the biggest change I made to this track was I completely changed the break two. So if you go back and listen to the original version of the track, this, this drum line sounds completely different. So yeah, that's completely different. I um and this is this loops back nicely to what I was saying about blocks earlier in the in the session. So because I've only got two blocks in this track, all I had to do was change the the drums in those two blocks. I didn't have to change them throughout the entire track. Just had to go into block one, swap out break break two with whatever I decide to change it to, which is this. Do the same thing in block two, and I was done. And it was really really easy, much much easier than uh, than than having to go through the entire track and sort of replacing everything manually. So, excellent. Yes, um, that throws me off every time I hear this track. So I, I did actually include the loon in the background, if you listen carefully. Um, and yeah, every time I listen to this track still, it throws me off. I'm like, who's, do who's doing that? Who's doing that? Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's, I think the loon is just slowly causing me to go insane, which is kind of funny. Um, so yeah, I replaced break two because originally it just sounded, I thought it sounded way too harsh. It just, it just didn't work for me. Um, and it was a really, really easy swap thanks to using blocks. So I just swapped it out. So I mentioned I don't like to change too much when I'm actually um, sort of going back and, and tweaking these tracks, but taking an entire um, drum drum loop out and swapping it out with something else in a track as reliant on the drums as this one. Um, yeah, that was, that was something else. But yeah, I, I really like how the drums came out in this track. Yeah, I'm super happy with how it turned out. And like I said, I've I enjoyed writing this so much. I've done a couple of other jungle tracks since then, and I just love playing around with break beats, especially with beat former as well, as kind of as like a quick way to kind of make them pop and sort of adjust them. It's so good, so good. Um, so yeah, really, really enjoyed it. Um, I also added a filter fade to the break beat at the end as well. So I added this break at the end. And I've also kind of had it filter out. Um, someone said, um, "Hang on, actually, I'm, I'm I'm just catching up on the chat, and there's there's quite a lot going on here that I've missed." <laughs> um, oh man, what? <laughs> Damn. Um, I'm sure someone mentioned that it sounded like it faded out better now. So whoever that was, thank you. But I can't actually find the comment now. So cheers. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just going back down. So um, yeah, so I I did some more changing of, of drum stuff. So um, there was a lot of harshness in some of these drums. So if we go back to the rack and have a look at some of these breaks, not so much with break two, break two is fine. So I, I kind of adjusted that and picked a break beat that was more suitable. Um, but with the Amen break um, in particular, it just sounded really, really, really harsh. Um, so I actually swapped the Beatformer and the Eve MP5 around because I wanted the EQ to, I wanted it to hit the EQ first and then the Beatformer just because I liked how that combination sounded. So I've mentioned this before and I feel like it's well worth repeating because it's a trick that is often overlooked. If you hold down shift while you drag rack elements around, it will rewire them automatically. So now the Beatformer is going into the Eve MP5 and I don't have to rewire anything that's just happening there. Um, whereas if I put it back, it will go Eve MP5 first, then Beatformer. Whereas if you just drag them normally, it's you just end up with this weird order and it's really annoying. And I really, really wish that was you could set that as the default behavior. Um, but that was kind of a mind blown moment when I discovered that and I was like, I've wasted so much of my life just cabling stuff unnecessarily. Um, so yeah, the uh, the Amen break was really, really harsh originally. So I decided to kind of bump up the high attenuation uh, on the MP5 there. And I also, um, yeah, I, I think that's pretty much all I did really. Buskin Bill says it was in the manual, Adam. I know, I, I've never fully read the Reason Manual, for shame. Um, but yeah, I, I think I've, I've read like bits of it. I think I stopped reading. I think I read the, most of the Reason Manual at Reason 2. 
Um, so there's a, there's a lot of it I haven't read. <laughs> um, so I also, there's um, this closed hat that comes in, which is the kind of pan sweepy one. I notched that because it was way too harsh originally. It was like the end of the track, just this hat kind of going, it was just, oh, it was obnoxious. Um, so I also uh, faded out the hat um, around bar 137. So that's here. So I just started fading that out so it's less of a, um, a less of a kind of abrupt stop. Um, uh, Monkey Plus Plus says, I like that it returns to the root. Yeah, I, 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 I quite like that sort of extra, extra note at the end. I can't remember if I added that or not. But yeah, that was, that was nice. Uh, Monkey Plus Plus has said, MP5 is legit a weapon of a rack extension. I, I agree with that. So you can kind of hear there the, the sort of more rapid hi-hat. It doesn't stick out of the mix. It's just kind of there to, to give everything a bit more energy. Um, yeah, uh, Shell Gratuit says, break two on the fade out sounds super nice now. Thank you, yeah, I'm, I'm really chuffed with how that turned out. Um, because originally it, it did just kind of end a bit suddenly and uh, I hope it's not too, I hope everything's not too resonant now as well. Because originally um, that was a point of contention during the stream, especially from Buskin Bills, uh, mentioned that certain elements were too resonant. And I think I got the balance right in the end. I hope I got the balance right. <laughs> um, Buskin Bills also says, in fact, I've, I've still got a pristine first version manual in its box with all the stickers. Ah, oh, that is so gutting. So I, I had um, all my, I had my big box version of Reason, Reason 1, up until about 2014 or so. And I'd left it on a window ledge and it just got completely, I had a damp problem in the room where I stored it and it completely ruined the box. And so I had to throw it out, and which was completely gutting. Thankfully, the contents were fine. So I think I've still got the manual kicking around, but uh, yeah, the, the actual box itself, that's gone, which sucked. Um, so yeah, but I've still got all the CDs and DVDs. So that's nice. Um, so yeah, so there was, there was quite a lot of harshness just basically going on with the drums. So I used the, the MP5 to, to kind of attenuate that somewhat. I've also muted the re-drum during the final block uh, here as well, because I think originally that had like quite a lot of stuff playing and it just seemed a bit weird how it just kept playing those parts. And on their own, they sound kind of not so great. And it was like, it just, it just didn't work for me with everything fading out, so I just muted that. Um, and I also there was an RX nine fifty. Oh, on the on the pad. So the pad that was a that was a fun one. So if you didn't check out the track, uh, if you didn't check out the stream last week, that main pad is just a sample from the factory sound bank stuck through grain, and it is this sample. So from that, I ended up with this. Which was really nice because that kind of sample locked chord, like using sampled chords like that, really restricts how you work and kind of what chords you can actually use in your track, which is very conducive to that sort of 90s feel. Um, very 808 state sample, as as mentioned. Um, it's it's yeah, it's really really good, and Grain just works perfectly with this stuff. It's it's just a really good way to get ideas going and mess around with kind of chord locked pads. Monkey Plus Plus has asked, does putting individual reverbs on tracks versus a common send ever cause unwanted buildup in signals? It's not happened yet. Um, so you, yeah, you may have noticed I don't tend to use aux sends during these streams a whole lot. And I don't tend to use aux sends a whole lot in most of my production. And that's because it's way, way, way easier to bounce stems if you've got everything locked inside an insert section. So it does make it trickier. So if I wanted to bring all the reverb back in the track, obviously I can't do that very easily. I can't just dial it back with one individual knob. Um, but it's not been a massive problem so far. I've recently actually had to bounce an old album of mine, all the stems, and it took me absolutely ages because I basically had to bounce everything so it was ready for someone to plop into whatever audio editor they wanted to use and have all of the effects locked in per track. So I had to bounce all of the sequencer channels individually with everything else going on and it took me 
the tra- the actual album itself had about 17 tracks on it and it took me absolutely ages um but i look forward to i was looking forward to never having to open any of those project files ever again and now i'm very meticulous with my stems um so that's not a problem but that's that's basically why i do it and it's kind of a a habit that i've just continued with during these streams but if you watch my really really old streams you'll notice me use orc sends quite a lot during those so it was just kind of a a change in, in thinking really um, so going back to the pad, originally this had an RX 950 on it, which I really, really liked. I really liked the sound of it, but as I mentioned originally, it um, as I closed the filter during this kind of break, t- t- during this drop here, um, it just sounded really, really, really resonant and yeah. So. I basically just took it out and swapped it out for this pad filter AF4 here. I wasn't using it, so I just removed it. Um, I also decreased the dry wet on the reverb and increased the time. So if we go down here, oh, this is all, this looks a bit weird, but that's how it should look. Um, so I, originally that was more wet. There was more, uh, I think the dry wet knob was turned up kind of more towards sort of 80, it's around the 80s or something like that. So I brought that back to 70% and turned up the time to sort of four seconds or so. So you get less of the actual reverb signal, but a longer tail, and that's kind of a nice balance. Um, yeah. Uh, Dravit said, I have my OG six box and my ignition key, which is my favorite accessory at this point. Fun fact, I um, had, when I first started using Record, they sent me a beta copy on a DVD, I believe, and that they sent me a really, really early version of the actual ignition key. It was like this little gray plastic thing. Um, and that actually lasted for ages until one day it died and I said guys my old beta ignition key has died can you please send me an actual proper key and they did which was really really nice of them Um, so yeah apparently Buskin Bills has said there's a new silver uh, ignition key that's interesting I haven't seen that Um, but yeah the uh, the, I had the sort of an old plasticky ignition key which was really interesting and eventually it just died a death which sucked (laughs) so uh yeah um what am i looking at now so yeah so that's something i tend to do quite a lot with a balancing reverb is to kind of reduce the wet signal but increase the tail so you get more of the kind of that sort of nice ethereal sort of swoosh at the end of of a sound but it's not it's not kind of cluttering the mix as much if that makes any sense so busker bill says on the shop it looks silver i'm totally gonna have to check this out afterwards because you have piqued my interest um so um yeah, so that's pretty much all I changed with the pad. Um, so there's also this this kind of champion Vox channel, which is this chappy, which I think I think that kind of that really cemented the '90s feel of this track for me when I listened back to it uh, the day after. I was like, that was a good call. That really cements the the feel there. So I actually added a, a touch of reverb to that because originally it didn't have any, and I thought it could do with kind of just washing out a bit and I think I also increased the the delay time as well because originally it was a a shorter delay time so I think originally it sounded more like this and you can't really make out each individual tail so I thought I'd just increase the delay time so you can make out each individual tap so that was that was cool. Um, yeah, I also reduced the feedback and turned the filter on just to kind of color the sound a bit. So yeah, that was that was really neat. Um, so yeah, that's all I changed with the Champion Vox channel and the pure vocal, which was that kind of pad, that sort of sweeping pad thing, which I which I showed off before. That's this thing if it ever plays. Oh, I'm soloing the wrong channel. So yeah, oh, um, yeah, that sounds really, in- um, just looking, Dravit said the red ones have the old logo, Buskin Bills said it's pants, it just has the code meter logo on it, referring to the to the ignition key. I'm not opening a browser window because I've got enough going on here as it is. Um, but um, yeah, that sounds a lot like the old one that I had, that was like this little plastic gray thing. That's really interesting. Um, 
so yeah so the pure vocal thing so i've showed off the the kind of whole pan sweeping thing already which i was i was going to mention um i've also added an instance of phaser which i haven't actually used in a while but it's a really really good free vst if you haven't used it it's modeled on the phaser effect on the access virus synth and i don't know what it is about it but i really like the sound of it so i just whacked it on this channel and if you haven't checked it out please i highly recommend it it's really good um yeah to the point where you know, I, I absolutely love my access virus and it's just great to be able to use the phaser effect on other stuff without having to actually use the access virus. Um, so yeah, strongly recommend checking that out and just kind of adds a little bit of movement. I also unmuted the block at bar 170. So around here, that this was muted originally. I just wanted that, wanted it to kind of fade out a bit more as the track progressed. Um, interestingly, Adam Zabo, who's the guy who made Phaser, he's also made a VST called Viper, I think, which is modeled on the Access Virus. And it's, yeah, I, I've, I tried it. It's not it's not quite there, as in my personal opinion, but I thought it was good. So if you're after that sound, I'd, I'd recommend giving it a look. I think it's Windows only, though. Um, Ty Blue says, Pure Vocal is sampled from Pure GTO, a classic early 90s rave track. Interesting. I learned. Today I learned. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really do a lot with that either. I think I just stretched it a bit and kind of cross-faded it and that was pretty much it. So if I go into comp edit, yeah, it's just, I just stitched it together and I think I reversed some stuff and stretched it and what have you. Um, I also drowned it in reverb and delay. So that was nice. Um, so yeah, I basically just had that fade out a bit longer at the end of the track because it just cut out and I felt like it needed to to round the track off a little bit more. Um, Thor Inside says, the other day I learned about the roll mode on the Echo. Kind of fun to make some weird glitches and short repeating sections. I haven't used that in ages and I'm not entirely sure why because you're right, that is a lot of fun to play around with. Um, so for anyone unfamiliar, if you've never used the delay roll mode, I'm just going to bust it out now. Um, stick it on this AMM break here. Um, I'm just going to fire this up and stick on an instance of the Echo and set it to roll mode. So now, actually I want that to be half and half. Oh no, I don't. What am I doing? Is this, oh, it's because it's not actually playing. <laughs> So yeah, that's a lot of fun, especially when you automate the uh, the delay time and you turn on keep pitch. So if we play around with that, I can... Uh... So yeah, it's a lot of fun. If Yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm going to have to bust that out in the future because that's tons of fun. Um, so yeah. Monkey Plus Plus says, today I learned. Uh, Buskin Bill says, stick an evolution on it. It's an effect, so I don't think that would work. Um, but yeah, I kind of like, if there was a way I could use evolution with that, that would be really cool. Hmm, that's got me thinking. Um, I think that's going to be an extracurricular project after this. <laughs> um, so yeah, I also decreased the dry wet on the uh, on that pure vocal as well because originally I think it was way too washed out and even now it's quite washed out so you can just kind of imagine what it sounded like before that's pretty washed out and I also increased again I increased the delay feedback and the time so you can kind of hear each individual tap I think in a track like this with a temp like a higher tempo you need to increase the the length of those delay taps so you can kind of make them out individually it's more satisfying to listen to I think um, and that's pretty much all I changed. So something else I wanted to, to show off as well. Um, Mitch Muda said, Reason is literally full of little things you just miss. Yeah, I'd, I honestly, I'd completely forgotten about the roll mode on the, um, on the Echo. I haven't used it in so long. So, um, so I'm just going to take this breakbeat here. I'm going to copy it into block three just so I have a blank slate. So I'm going to just stretch that out so it's twice as long as it should be. <laughs> so that's using Reason's all round stretch mode. Um, so if you use the melody mode, that actually gives you more of a kind of granular sound, which is 
more really in line with the era in which this would have been made it's kind of like more of a granular stretching sound so if we play that again so i actually quite like that sound it um if you can take it to way more extreme extremes like this so it's Always reminds me of that scene in The Matrix when Neo ends up with the, the silvery goo going down his throat and he screams and it turns into this granular sound. I always really liked that. Um, Treezer says, how are you organizing your rack devices between different lanes? I'm still used to you. I still use only one lane. Um, so at the moment during these streams, I tend to have one column for bass and drums, which being a more sort of drum and bass track, that, that seemed kind of sensible. And in this track, I've just got synths and pads in the other columns. So there's not really a lot going on in this track. Um, if I was working on something else, I might have acoustic drums in one in one column and pads and poly synths in another. Um, it's, it's a good way to keep yourself from getting lost, I think. Although a lot of the time, if I'm working on a track quickly, I will just end up with one big long lane um, because I'm used to, I'm, that's still that part of me that's used to using Reason where you could only use one uh, column and a, a part of me just still does that because I'm so used to doing that like 10 years of use um, uh, yeah uh, Mitch Mood says I think it's complex one has a patch called Neo something or other which sounds like that well let's I'm gonna fire that up because I don't think I've heard that for shame um, where propeller head complex one so next time I should probably install friction before I start and use it. <laughs> um, complex one is, I would assume it's in abstract. No. Um, so I've just gone off on a complete tangent here. It won't be in there. No, 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 Neo. Melodic. No, if you can remember where it is, then please let me know because, um, I could just search, you know. <laughs> it's always sensible. Um, no, I can't. I can't find it. So, yeah, I'm not a massive fan of, of searching for stuff using Reason's browser because it's really slow <laughs> uh, most of the time. So that's why I don't tend to use it. In case anyone's wondering, um, Monkey Plus Plus says, "I wish the rack could be docked to the left of the mixer. I always end up busting it out into a different window." Um, yeah, it's uh, I, I tend to use, well, I use a two monitor setup. So I tend to have the mixer on my right monitor and my sequencer or rack on the left. And it's super, super useful. Um, if you've ever considered going to a dual monitor setup, I highly recommend it. It's really good. Um, so yeah, that's so there's the melodic mode and there's also the vocal mode. And that normally doesn't work so well, but <laughs> I'm going to bring that back. So that's interesting, but I, it doesn't sound quite as harsh. It's like this awkward middle ground. Um, what have I done here? Um, all right, I'm just gonna undo that. <laughs> there we go, let's put it back. Neo Geo, ah, Neo Geo, interesting. Um, Parsec, right, I'm gonna have a look at that. Um, although I would assume that Neo Geo is in is a reference to the console rather than uh, the Matrix, but I'm interested by this now. Off I go on another one of my tangents. <laughs> um, oh, Pars yeah, you said Parsec, yeah. I'm just getting confused between Pul Parsec and Pulsar. Also, I haven't used Parsec in a while. No, 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 Neo Geo, that'll be an FX, I imagine. No, no. Neo Geo, there we go, right. Ah, yes, that is quite similar. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for that. I enjoyed that. Um, Dravit said, why do I suck at Parsec so completely? So I actually did a bunch of uh, patch design for, I can't remember if I did any patches for the actual main sound bank for Parsec, but I did do some stuff with Nuclear Sound Lab. And that was interesting because I basically had to force myself to sort of how to, the first thing I tend to do when I do any kind of patch design project is figure out sort of the best settings to get, like what the synth is best suited for. So yeah, um, 
I, and I can't really remember what my conclusion was with Parsec, but I think it was kind of more sort of watery kind of sounds, like glassy, watery kind of sounds. Um, so I think I focused mostly on that. And it's definitely got its own quirks. Um, it's not, you can't really approach it with the same sort of way of thinking as say like The Legend or, or VK2 or something like that because they're completely different synths. Um, it's, yeah, as Claude Mars said, Pask is really good for pads and atmospheres. And it has this kind of, like, I think it has this kind of watery, glassy feel about it. Um, it's definitely a unique beastie, um, but I like it. I like it. So, yeah. So, Travis said, I'm having an easier time getting complex. I'd, I would love to, as Monkey Plus Plus has said, uh, do an in depth sound design stream at some point, especially using complex. I feel like at this point, I need to reacquaint myself with it and get really good at it again before I start before I even consider doing something like that because at the moment it would be a bit of a letdown. So uh, as Claude Mutt said, I did the demo song for Complex. So if you go to SoundCloud and check that out, um, it was, I feel like the amount of effort I put in compared to the incredibly talented sound designers who made the sounds I stitched together for that track was, it kind of paled in comparison really. So, so give them some credit because the sounds that come with it are absolutely brilliant. Some great stuff. So... So yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about with, with Facing Giants. Um, and I also wanted to show off that that kind of stretch algorithm thing because uh, that was mentioned earlier. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it really. So if anyone else has anything they'd like to ask me, then please, by all means, I'd be more than happy to, to go into it. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to kind of pop up all over the place when it comes to rack extensions and, and reason related stuff. I'm always there kind of lurking, waiting to provide a demo song. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I really, really, I, I keep saying it. I really, really enjoyed um, Facing Giants. Claude Mutz asked, what's the plan next week? I plan to write a tune next week, but I have no idea what I'm gonna do and I'll just see where it goes from there, really. I'm probably not going to be doing Jungle on stream again because I feel like it's good to keep things varied, but we'll we'll see where we go. And yeah, just 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 see what, what happens. Uh, Buskin Bill says, Adam, how long have you been a Reason Insider? That's uh, that's an interesting question. Because um, I, did, I did get the Reason 4 beta. I can't remember if I was on the Reason 3 beta testing team, but I was, I've been doing it for a while. Um, Shell Gratuit says, this all makes me want to switch to Reason, but I feel like it costs me too much. I would say, um, if you want to just try it out, you can get the Reason Rack, I think it's Reason Rack Lite or something. Um, you can get that pretty cheap um, from Plugin Boutique or free with some stuff. Um, so that might be a good way to just kind of dip your toes in and see if, if the Rack kind of paradigm works for you. Obviously you won't get the sequencer and everything around it, but that's... Uh, that's kind of that would be a good place to just just have a have a dip, see if you like it. Um, so yeah, disco friction next week. I'm I'm probably not going to be doing uh, 80s disco. I I tried it and it was just god awful and it was soul crushing. <laughs> so I'm probably not going to be doing it. But you know, never say never. <laughs> um, from disco fever to disco friction. I don't like the sound of disco friction. That sounds that sounds painful. Um, use friction to make an ELO style song with big strings. Ooh, that'd be interesting. It'd be interesting to combine friction with like orchestra or something. I think that'd be kind of fun. Uh, plus give us, maybe it would be nice to see a fail now and again. I'm, I'm sure I'm due on, I'm sure I'm due, due a really crappy stream with a really awful track. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna answer some of the questions that are popping up in chat after this stream. I'll, I'll stick around for a bit afterwards. Um, but for now, I'm, I'm just going to kind of wrap up uh, the actual retrospective thing. So next week, like like I said, I'll be back to writing tunes. And I actually feel kind of relieved to have gone back over these tunes because I didn't realize I'd left it so long to go over Midnight, uh, midnight, midnight Circuits in particular. Um, so it was nice to kind of just go over that and sort of have a, have a little bit of closure with relation to that. So, I mean, since I've actually wrote it, I've ended up remixing it for the actual eventual album release thing. So, yeah. <laughs> Mitch Mood, if you're looking for a crap stream, I'm happy to fire up OBS. Uh, I'm, don't, don't, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, I, uh, I'm going to sort of say farewell if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're watching on Twitch, stick around and I'll hang around for a little bit longer. And, yeah. 
great great seeing everyone as always and i hope you enjoyed the stream and i hope you'll join me for for the next one cheers and see you next time bye bye